Hi, and welcome to Itsy Bitsy Book Bits. Today I'm reading to you from Wasabi by C.A. King. Chapter One Talbot and Danson. The room buzzed with the sound of fingers tapping on laptop keyboards, the noise only slightly louder than the generators keeping them powered. Technology wasn't completely lost. Humanity still had a few aces up their sleeves. So, General Talbot huffed impatiently, can you make any sense from the research? Reports from the outside world aren't holding much promise. We may need that cure Carlson was working on. I'm afraid not, Danson admitted. His work is well beyond the scope of anyone in this facility. Perhaps in time. Talbot's fist came down on the desk with force, sending pens and papers flying. We don't have any time. He rubbed the wrinkles on his forehead, many of which had appeared over the past few weeks. I don't even know why I am a part of this little meeting, McCleary scoffed. I work with weapon development, not biology or medicine. Carlson's notes look like chicken scratches to me. If you want me to build a bomb... We are in an underground facility, the general interrupted, in a calm voice but stern. A bomb is the last thing we need. Do you know what would happen if it exploded down here? Yeah, McCleary answered, shrugging his shoulders. The place would cave in. We'd all be dead. So why even suggest building one? The general questioned, inhaling deeply. Because that is what I know how to do, Jim McCleary complained. Not this stuff. He tossed a stack of papers, letting them scatter on the floor. This is the same as asking a Russian soldier in English to answer a question in Chinese. There aren't too many people who could comply. We have scientists here, don't we? The general snapped. What happened to the great minds we were supposed to be saving? They're all here, Danson replied, a specialist from almost every scientific area. Unfortunately, Carlson was to be one of them. Leaving him behind created a gap in your perfect plan. He was reduced to a bumbling idiot, Talbot scowled. He would have been no use to us. Without him, we won't get far with his research, Danson stated. We could try to send a team to find him. No, Talbot replied, leaning back in his chair. They are long dead. I don't want anyone leaving the compound. That includes those up there. His eyes rolled toward the ceiling. We need to stay focused. If mutants show up on the radar, we are locking down the whole place. We'll wait them out. You think we will outlive the mutants? Danson asked. It's likely they have the same lifespan as you or I. Yes, Talbot agreed. But they can't reproduce, and we can. While it is true we may not see the day of victory ourselves, our children or grandchildren will. That's why you let Sally come along, Jim scoffed. She's young and fertile, Talbot admitted. I saw no reason not to bring an extra woman along. It may rest on our shoulders to repopulate the country one day. What about the terrorists behind the plan? Danson asked. I am positive we disposed of any future threat for them, Talbot replied. We blew up whatever they had planned. Then why are we holed up in here? Jim snapped. If the threat was eliminated, we should be fine. Don't be an idiot, Talbot barked. We took out the leaders. The virus still exists. We are waiting for the infected to die off. Alive mutants can still pass on the virus to any human they come in contact with. General, a young soldier yelled, waving a small piece of paper. Message by Pigeon. Well, don't just stand there yelling about it, Talbot barked. Hand it here, son. He held out his hand, pressing two fingers against the middle of the glasses sitting on the bridge of his nose. What does it say? Danson asked. There's been contact, Talbot replied, dropping his glasses on the desk. The mutants are apparently communicating. What are they saying? McCleary questioned, scowling. They want us to surrender, General Talbot muttered. According to this, they have sent terms. The surviving leaders of the world want to meet to discuss them. What sort of terms? Danson eyed his superior, looking for any signs of emotion, but finding none. They let us live. Allow us to exist, Talbot mumbled. We, in return, would be their slaves. How do we know this is real and not a trick to flush out our leaders? McCleary asked. This is the first we've heard of any of the mutants being able to communicate. It all seems rather 
excuse the pun, fishy. What if it wasn't? Danson snapped. What if the noises coming from radio frequencies and other sound waves were attempts to speak to us and we missed it? Talbot rubbed the bridge of his nose with his thumb and forefinger. No, he scribbled a reply. I'm not about to surrender the freedom of any man, woman or child. He handed the paper back to the one from whom it came. Send the pigeon with this. We will sit tight, even if it is until we take our last breaths. Do you really want to refuse the other leaders in such a way? Danson questions. They might not include us in their future plans. I don't think this is from any other camp, Talbot explained. At least, not a human one. It's obviously a trick. He stood, rubbing his hands together. I believe I'll fetch some dinner. McCleary watched his superior stroll away. Do you think he's right? I don't know, Danson huffed. If he is, we have a bigger problem. Assuming the enemy wrote and sent that note, not only are the mutants much more intelligent than we knew them to be, they also know the location of this base. It won't until they come knocking on the front door. What should we do? McCleary asked. Start making those bombs, Danson answered. We may need them and any other weapons you can come up with. But the general is getting old, Danson interrupted. If he can't make a logical decision... He'll have to be replaced, for humanity's sake. You take your orders from me from now on. Yes, sir, McCleary answered. I'll get right to it. Danson stared at the papers scattered about the general's desk. Talbot had lost. Survival was more important than destroying terrorist threats. That wasn't how the military worked. It was up to them to make the world a better place to live for future generations, not breed like bunnies... Hiding with their tails between their legs wasn't good enough. The commander made his way to an elevator. Private, he said. I need you to go topside and take a unit with you to look for Dr. Carlson. Yes, sir, the young man replied, saluting. His body remained stiff as a board, listening for additional orders. All reports are to come back to me, and me only, Danson ordered. Is that understood? Yes, sir. Good. Danson eyed the soldier up and down. Bring the doctor back alive and there will be a promotion in your future. Thank you, sir, the private replied. I won't let you down. See that you don't, Danson snapped. The fate of the world might be riding on this mission. Carlson was the key. A cure for the virus was the only thing that would turn things in humanity's favour. Hopefully, the doctor was still alive and willing to work with the military, if not, there were still a couple bombs to toss around. He wasn't going down without a fight. Chapter 2 Eileen Revenge Her brother's killer, Sashimi, was still on the loose. When Charlie named the creature with his final human breath, he made the creature her obsession. Unfortunately, retaliation took a back seat to survival. Simply put, there were bigger fish to fry at the moment. Sashimi might have been on the menu in Treacle, but the town she knew and loved was on the verge of being swallowed whole by the sea. A tactical retreat was necessary. Albeit, if so much as a trace of her arch nemesis showed up, she was filleting it. This aquatic beast wasn't being served raw either. It was getting pan-seared, then deep-fried, twice over. The whole Charlie's death Death in her heart was excruciating. Avenging him was the only way to fill it. Killing Sashimi, the one who stole her brother from her, was the only way things would pan out for her, the only way there'd be a bright future. The sea dwellers had already won enough battles and killed enough people to take a brazen approach. They had earned the right to be cocky. They'd forced humanity, they'd forced her to hole up, camouflaged, playing a deadly game of hide-and-seek. In this version, it was live or die. It was a good thing she hated to lose. The rev of the engine eased, the strong breeze slowing to form an eerie, unnatural draught. The skies had been sunny up until only a few minutes prior, but the air carried the faint scent of moisture, sending a warning that grey clouds were on the move and heading their way. A shock raced through her fingers from contact with the metal part of a seatbelt. 
Brewing weather shouldn't have any effect on persons inside a vehicle. The tyres grounded them. An electrical charge of that size and still growing around her meant one thing. An extreme thunder and lightning event was imminent. Hopefully it wasn't a killer downpour. How close is the storm, she asked. Rod glanced back at her. It's hard to tell. These aren't the same meteorologic conditions we're used to. It's not only the lo the oceans that are changing, or perhaps it is the ocean which is controlling the atmosphere. Without the proper equipment, there is no way of knowing. Ned pressed his foot down on the gas pedal. I don't want to be around when it starts pouring deadly rice or seaweed gets blown around our necks and strangles us. Thank you for that visual, Eileen huffed. It was as if they needed to make up new enemies. There were strong enough strange things trying to eliminate them. Sorry, Ned said, the chuckle under his breath contradicting his one-word answer. If there is one thing I've learned from this, it's that anything is possible. Looks like there's a town up ahead, Rod said. We can take cover there. Cover? Eileen's eyebrows arched at the thought. Was such a place real? Was it safe to stay put for any length of time? A deep rumbling exploded overhead, clouds slamming against one another in the great mosh pit of the sky. This was one dance she was willing to sit out. The sky lit up, a bolt of electricity hitting a pole beside them. It fell on their path only seconds after they passed by. Rain began to fall. It started as a pitter-patter, each drop becoming stronger. The force of the precipitation went from a light sprinkling to a full downpour of cats and dogs. Crack! A single drop pierced the windshield, leaving a large circular impact shot spot with a spider web like fracture all around. Tires skidded, their direction swerved, heading straight toward a strip mall. Watch out! Eileen screamed. Their speed wasn't decreasing enough, they were going faster. Ned, what are you doing? she cried. Hold on, he answered, and you might want to duck. Her jaw dropped. They were going in, just in the nick of time, her head lowered, hiding behind her knees. Glass shattered, metal scraped, sparks flew, tires squealed. Silence. She peered up. Lucky, Rod said, eyes twinkling. She glanced at him in horror. Be about it. They drove straight through a storefront. What in the blazes made you do that? We could have died. The car might be irre irreversibly damaged. Rod pointed to the windshield. He made the right call. If the impact of precipitation had this much force on bulletproof glass, imagine what a single drop could do to flesh and bone. I know I wouldn't want to try running from a parking spot. Still not lucky, she complained in a huff. We are in a sporting goods store, Ned said. That's the best we could hope for. Agreed. Look around, Rod suggested. There's protein bars, vitamins, sports drinks, shoes, clothing for all seasons, and I'm willing to bet some ammunition. Arthur sighed. There seems to be quite an extensive fishing section as well. What does that mean? Paul's eyes bulged. Is that bad? Yeah, Arthur rubbed the stubble on his chin. Odds are there is a place to fish near here. Wherever there is water, the mutants are never far behind. Rod grabbed a few handheld radios from a shelf in a camping style backpack take what you can we'll wait out the storm and head straight to a gas station when it breaks the sky lit up bang lightning hit somewhere near here arthur said emerging from a squatting tower stay clear of anything metal in case it hits the building let's hope that last strike wasn't the gas pumps ross tossed rod tossed a pair of rubber soled shoes across a few aisles they landed directly in her hands Thanks. She frowned at the design. These weren't made for fashion. In fact, they were downright un ugly. This wasn't a runway in Paris, though. Be ready, Rod said. The moment we have a chance to leave, we are out of here. He opened the rear door of the car. You need to eat. The dog barked in agreement. Carlson, however, sat staring straight forward at nothing in particular. And drink. Rod tossed in a few bars and a bottle of water just as the mutt jumped out. Their furry friend's sustenance was ready and waiting in bowls on the floor. Is he going to be okay? she asked. Rod shrugged. 
We all handle trauma differently. He's alive. Whether or not he decides to actually live again is up to him. No one can make the choice for him or force him. No one could compel anyone to do anything. But wasn't surviving on everyone's to-do list? She certainly wasn't going to give up. Not now. Not ever.